a lot of Malaysians, especially the highest skilled ones uh, like Bundi, they will just leave Malaysia, go elsewhere. They can earn at least double, triple pay, have the almost the same quality of life. Yeah. Okay. Welcome back to another episode of the Backholder Pod. Today, we're going to touch on a topic that probably will hold quite dearly to many Singaporeans' heart. So I'm just going to read off a particular stats from Singapore Business Review. They say that one in three Singaporeans travel to Johor Bahru at least once a month, with 21% stating that they have some form of investments there. So I think specifically, I think uh, with accordance to how the SGD and Ringgit has been performing over the, I guess, last two to three years, it has been on a steady uptrend and then a slight pullback recently. So at its peak, um, the SGD to Ringgit conversion was around 3.52 per one Singapore dollar. And today, at SF of the, and today, as of the time of this recording, it's sitting right around 3.28. So specifically, I think let's just um, extend the discussion to how the Malaysian economy is doing this whole um, Singapore to Malaysian ringgit exchange rate and what's our expectations moving forward. Because I do believe or I do understand that there are many Singaporeans that do convert actively on across the causeway and maybe to do their shopping um, to support the economy a little bit. But I think maybe just to extend the discussion on what you guys think of the whole um, exchange rate increasing and is this going to be sustainable or not. So maybe I'll open the time to Bunti on your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think for the ringgit, right, if you look at the trend, especially if you plot the chart of ringgit versus sing, right, just extend the period a little bit, you'll see that Singapore has been appreciated steadily against Malaysia ringgit now. Uh, it's just that recently, just recent, I think few months, right, there's a bit of like strengthening of ringgit. I think that's tied to US monetary policy because uh, we all know that since US hiked the interest rate to a high level, right, all these monies from the emerging market has been flowing to US to enjoy the high interest rate. And now since the latest Fed announcement, it seems like there's a bit of like pivot in, in terms of the direction, the US want, wanting to cut rates. So now I think money is flowing the other way around, meaning my, money is flowing from US, out of US, back to all these emerging markets. And Malaysia is always one of the popular emerging markets. Uh. So I think this strengthening is in line with this uh, flow of money. Uh. Not, nothing really surprising because I think if we just look at over the long term, right, uh, if you just compare Sing versus Malaysia Ringgit, I think Sing dollar will continue to appreciate. So I think this is all tied to the long-term policy on how, how the currency is managed. Uh. Nothing to do with the short-term flow. Short -term so, flow yeah. so, so in theory, meaning Singapore's monetary stance or our strategy is always to constantly appreciate our currency to make imports. As in, it's part of a grander strategy to always be appreciating Singapore dollar against everything, right? Against all other currencies. Is it right, right to say that? Yeah, I think that's one. That, that's a good way to summarize it. It is appreciating not for like no reasons, you know. It's it's like because of the policy of how it's managed. Because for countries that are producing stuff, right, they they need a cheap currency to make their export attractive. But Singapore don't have this issue. Singapore is more like just sitting uh, in between, like just controlling the trades, the flow. So a Singapore country, right, they don't really need a weak currency to to improve the ex export, lah. So that, that's why all this tied together with the currency management. And I think for Singapore, if we talk about short term, right? Yes, it, it will follow USD trend, which is towards depreciation. Uh, that's because Singapore currency is managed based on a basket of currencies, right? And out of that basket, I think USD is still take a, quite a significant share. So. I think extending this, right? Just wanted to ask, because I believe there are quite a few topics, um, especially on the YouTube platform, where people thinking about an appreciating ringgit or at least the short-term bullishness might signal a stronger economy moving forward. Because I guess um, there's higher demand for your currency, um, there's more foreign direct investments going into the country. That's why um, it kind of improves the sort of exchange rate. So one, I think Kelvin recently just did a video. Maybe Kelvin want to expand a little bit on this topic. So I think other than the ringgit, because ringgit didn't just do well, it outperformed all the basically every every other currencies in the world. Uh. Also partly because ringgit was super undervalued. So when there's a good news, you will just straight away bounce back up like like China. <laughs> so so for ringgit, I think it's about. First of all, just now Jiggy mentioned about the foreign direct investment, so that like stuff like data centers, or that the, the building of the semiconductors stuff. Like. So basically more investors are coming into Ringgit. That's that helps to push the price up. Like. So 
but other than that, I think Bunti in our discussion, Bunti mentioned that like for semiconductors, Malaysia has actually been doing that all along, right? So it's actually nothing new. It's more like confidence is coming back to the ringgit because the new government is doing something right <laughs> for something for a change, doing something right. So basically confidence is coming back. But this time I don't know how much it will boost the ringgit. Like will it continue to depreciate against the Sing dollar and US dollar? Personally, I believe it it would continue to depreciate that. Like because all these are like short term thing. And unless we see more investors coming into the ringgit, lah. Otherwise, it will continue to come back down. Like maybe three point five to one thing. Yeah. What what does everything? Actually, I'm not very sure of the currency movement. I I think. There's several factors, right? Other than the US thing, like what Mbuti shared. It's also to do with the GDP, how the economy is doing, all that. But I'm not sure whether there's a stronger ringgit, right? Does it actually mean that it's very bad for the exporters necessarily? Like how, how does the... I think it's more like short-term basis. I say, for example, let's say Malaysia make a lot of all these gloves, right? So, and, and Malaysia is not the only country that make these gloves. For example, China also export gloves. So let's say if now you are at equilibrium and suddenly ringgit just strengthen, right? Mm. So all these gloves makers, basically they just do everything, you know, unchanged, right? But now when trying to compete for the market, right? Now their, their items become like, let's say a 10% appreciation in, in ringgit means that their product is 10% more expensive. So, so this will actually put some pressure in terms of can, can they actually, basically it's bad for the exporters uh, when, when, the, when your local currency is strengthening. So all this will have some short-term I- impact. Uh. Now, I imagine if you're doing like business like exporting gloves and all that, right? Mm. you probably will have some longer term contracts, right? Instead of like, oh, from day to day, people place order. Let's say I place an order from the US, I buy gloves from you, right? I say yeah. that it is at this currency exchange rate. Then you have to deliver like one million gloves to me, like by but all this contract. There's some limit to it, right? You, let's yeah. say you you can sell for the upcoming few months, right? So this strengthening also we are not talking about like one day strengthening. So mm. let's say it's like appreciating for eighteen months. Will they hurt the export? I, I think it will. Uh, this is just common common things, right? No, sorry. What I mean was if your currency suddenly strengthen, right, and the people paying you in their currency like USD, right? Then your currency strengthen, it means that from the time they sign the contract, you are getting 1 million USD. Then now your currency strengthen already, it means that you are getting less, maybe lesser by 5%. So doesn't that like impact your profit margin also? Because you are, you are delivering the goods based on the previous, you know, the exchange rate. Yeah. Then what about new business? Ma? That, that's the question, right? So this is done already. Then what about the upcoming one? Okay, so, so you will definitely eat the loss based on the previous contract, right? Then the new business, then like you say, there's competition. Mm. So I, I don't know, this uh, rapid rapid change in like the currency exchange, I, I think that it has some negative impact because people have already positioned themselves for this kind of exchange rate. Then suddenly there's a change just like the interest rate, right? When there's a sudden jump and people are caught wrong-footed, then, oh, all the what yuan carry trade and all these things, then all they start to unwind everything. So I don't know whether, is it net-net, is it positive for the country if the currency suddenly there's a sharp increase? Yeah, I think it's like good or bad, it's not like for, we cannot see too macro. Let's say on country level, there are so many mixed things, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a combination of many factors, but usually, let's say when the currency is appreciating, it's bad for the exporter, but good for the importers. Because for example, now you are importing goods to sell from, let's say from Europe, and then you sell it in Malaysia, right? Now, ringgit becomes a lot more, you know, like strengthening. So you can actually now use your more powerful ringgit to buy goods from overseas and then import into, into the country. So good or bad, depending on on whether you are importing or exporting, and then also depending on locally, what's your cost structure like? Because for example, let's say you, you say you're producing gloves, but all the inputs also you import from, from somewhere, then not much problem really, right? Because your, your costs are all USD, your price also is in USD, so no effect. But most of the industry, uh, let's say all this factory, right? The inputs are actually sourced locally. The labor also sourced locally. 
So there's a mismatch between the, your cost structure, the currency of your cost versus the revenue, which is usually in USD when, when you export to, you know, outside of the country. So that mismatch will create this, you know, whether you benefit or you, you, you will suffer, it, it will depends on the action of, of the currency. It feels like we are discussing economy 101. Eh? Chicken, I think this is your expertise, right? Go yeah, no, I don't, I, I don't have expertise here because uh, my only expertise is I will go JB to help farm the economy. No I mean, in a very small way, sometimes I am a frequent traveler to, to JB with, with friends because of the supposedly higher purchasing power. La. Or like, you know, sometimes you feel very... Um, you, you feel like it's very expensive in Singapore, so you hold back your spending. Then maybe uh, once every quarter you go to JB and then you unleash your spending and then you help you help boost the, the consumption. But in a way, I think I think I wanted to extend the discussion on when Bunti was talking about this whole FDI semiconductor and whatnot, because I believe he's a small expert in that space as well, because um, he has been studying a lot in the in the supply chain and, and whatnot. So I just wanted to understand, do you think this incoming like FDI in terms of data center, but the whole ecosystem of supply chain around that space, especially when we're talking about this AI boom, do you think it will lead to very consequential like developments in, in Malaysia? Like is this is this their GPT moment? I don't think it will be that consequential because Semicon in Malaysia is not new. It has been there since you know early years. You know, in let's say 70s, 80s, right? When this entire semicon just started, right? Uh, there, there are many factories around Asia because they require a lot of like, human need to make all those things, piece those things together, right? So I think in the early years, they, they try to set up all these factories in, let's say, like Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia. So th these are the, even South Korea, right? So these are the countries that attract semicon companies set up factory, okay? Then after that, I think, Specifically, Taiwan and South Korea, they, they all successfully move into like advanced uh, chip making, but Malaysia just lagged behind that. Uh, so, uh, but but this uh, semicon sector in Malaysia has been has been for many many years. For example, Intel has their factory in Penang for I think at least few decades already. So so they they have knowledgeable like the base of workers right, who are knowledgeable in semicon manufacturing. But I think for Malaysia, the focus is more on the packaging uh, not really on the manufacturing of, on, of the chips. Of course, for low level chips, I think maybe they have some capability to do that. But if we are talking about AI chips, Nvidia chips, all these, the latest iPhone chips, right? All this, I would say mainly came from Taiwan and also South Korea. So Malaysia is a bit behind, but but still the entire end-to-end -end, uh, ecosystem, right? You you need people to manufacture the chips. You need people to you know package the chips. You need people to test the chips. So it's end-to-end it's -end process. And some of these processes, if you don't have to do it in Taiwan, you, you can outsource it to like China, to Malaysia, to, to other countries. If they are cheaper, then it makes sense to, to do it there, right? So I think the, the good thing is that I think the latest development is that there are more companies set up all these, you know, businesses in Malaysia and, and in various parts of Malaysia. I think that's encouraging. I, th I think that's a testament uh, that Malaysia, like, you know, country, uh, the, the policymakers are doing the right things are be in the forms of like you know tax incentive or, or whatnot but they have all these things to attract fdi so i think that's good kelvin actually all these fdi it will create jobs in malaysia the reason fdi is in malaysia is because labor is cheap in malaysia land is cheap in malaysia right but it won't directly benefit the people because at most it will just create more new jobs which based on Malaysia's average pay. So we were, oh, I got more job, but my pay is still Malaysia's pay. So basically Malaysia is stuck in this thing called middle income trap. La. So because a lot of cheap labor, right? So if they need more cheap labor, Malaysia can go and import like the Bangladesh, people, people from India. Not, not saying they are cheap, la. basically people are willing to come here to work for cheap. Yeah. So I think Malaysia is, right now is stuck. Like at the start, I think Malaysia is ahead at least on par with other countries like Taiwan, like Hong Kong, even for Singapore, right? Then all, all the rest of the countries all break past this middle income trap because they are, they are upgrading their own people, stuff like that. But for Malaysia, they are importing cheap labor. So that's why, that's what, that's also the thing that attract all these FDIs. So I think Malaysia now, the next issue to solve is to 
break out of this middle income trap. Lah. And I don't think it's easy <laughs> because yeah. Yeah, they, they will need to pump a lot of money into upskilling people lah, and to go yeah. up the, this whole uh, manufacturing chain, supply chain thing. Yeah. I, I think it's more like chicken and egg situation because you cannot say that, okay, from now on, we all upgrade our ed- educations, you know, like do something on the university degrees or whatever, right? I think it's not because you are, you are producing all this, like, you know, labor, but what are they going to do? So if they got nothing to do, right, after you train them up, right, they go to Taiwan, you go to South Korea, they, they work overseas already. So actually what, what you want, right, as a country is to attract all these businesses and preferably you don't want to attract those doing commodity type of business. Right? You want like, you know, advanced, those technology driven companies set up shops in like local places first, and then you attract more talents from overseas and then let all these, you know, foreign talents train up the local people so that there's, you know, the activities stay within after the, the incentive to, you know, like build up. Once the demand is there, right, let's say the factory is there already, they require people with PhD level. Then university, they will start to churn up people with PhD, PhD degree because it makes sense to do so, right? There's demand, factory is there. So, so I think that's the first step. So you need to make sure that the activity come to the country first. That, that should be, that should come first. Then the rest will follow later. Like. I think that's the, that's the steps. Uh. Not like I, I produce first. It's, if not, our labor train up already. I think Malaysia in terms of education train up quite, quite, quite some number of talents, but all exported and export outside really don't want to come back. So I think that that's why they struggle. Uh. That's also the reasons of the middle income trap. Then the other thing is, I think Malaysia is very protective of their own companies. They call it prote- protectionism. So like even for, I think Mumu, Mumu the broker, to enter Malaysia is, I, I don't think it was easy. But then before Mumu, many of the brokers there are like, wow, you use the broker, it like, it's like 20 years ago, that kind of broker, that kind of interface. Then when Mumu come in, wow, it straight away beat all the brokers in Malaysia. In terms of everything, like, like better features, better UI, better, everything better. So this is the other thing, like if you want Malaysia to, to improve on itself, you need to enable competition and not just like put that, put that, put that, put that. <laughs> Everyone is stuck there doing like their own thing. Like, like you see the like KTM, Malaysia's the railway track. Is there's constant delays. You, you think Singapore is bad? Boom. Uh, the uh, one weekend, the Jurong there, the line broken. Malaysia is like constantly broken. The windows, uh, people going crack, crack the windows, that kind of thing. So because because there's no competition mark, so there's no need to improve. So if you want to raise the whole standard of Malaysia, I think you just need to remove this whole thing, let the people fight for themselves, and then, then Malaysia will improve. La. But otherwise, Malaysia, the Malaysians, a lot of Malaysians, especially the highest skilled ones uh, like Bundi, they will just leave Malaysia, go elsewhere, they can at least double, triple pay, have the almost the same quality of life. Yeah. Okay, any concluding thoughts? I just want to ask, like, you all seen the recent article on OpenAI opening a Singapore office. Yeah. So actually, then if, uh, can I just ask a question to Bunti, right? If you open AI, right, what will make you choose one place over another? Like, what's so attractive about Singapore? Why don't I just open an office in Malaysia since the land cheaper, the labor yeah. costs cheaper? Yeah. I, I think these openings, they are hiring. I saw a, a few vacancies. Uh, one, one of them is like sales salesperson. Mm. But what kind of sales they want to drive, right? I also don't know. But my guess is that they, they want someone, uh, Singapore would be the, you know, like the Asia hub. And then from the Asia hub, they want to, you know, sell the entire, all this open AI tool to the companies uh, mainly. Because, you know, like one company, let's say you have like 10,000 customers, right? Actually, not every companies are allowing their employees to use open AI, like all this chat GPT. So if you can't use it, right, because I think mainly companies are afraid of, you know, data leak out from, from, you know, like proprietary data or the customer sensitive data mm. that leak out to, to these companies, right? So they, they don't allow access. And what is needed for them to access is that they need to, you know, that a way to safeguarding all this data. So you can still use, but your data don't, don't mix together with the rest of the data and let, let open AI just absorb everything. Uh. So there, there should be some form of like contract like what they can take, what they cannot take. And then when they safeguard that, right, actually just one deal, one customer, let's say 10,000 employees, then you pay, let's say like $10 or, or $20 per per account, per per account per month, right? So I think that's that's the business that 
uh, open AI want to be in. Uh. Basically, subscription business. Uh. So mainly it's sales, I think. Uh, if those outside of sales one, for example, like technical roles, I think they those people or those stationed in Singapore probably they still need to work with the US colleagues. Uh. Yeah. But, but mm. what's, what's the benefit of like um, hiring here, opening an office here versus just across the causeway Mm. You open a Johor office, like uh, mainly is to serve Asia customers, uh. So let's say if you're stationed in Singapore, you 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 are selling to let's say some companies in KL, right? Just fly over, uh. I think Singapore is just a hub, uh. It's More like the, actually it's uh. their second office in Asia. The first one is in Japan. Okay, so mm. so basically the the advantage here is this more accessible in terms yeah. of like connectivity. Yeah, yeah. connectivity. Uh. Like, like from Singapore, you want to fly to everywhere in Asian in Asia, also quite quite easy to to travel, right? Yeah. Okay. Actually, I got a question, Bundi. Like, let's say if you are not a Singaporean now, what Malaysian ringgit to Sing dollar? What level will you go back to Malaysia? Hey. Point three lah. <laughs> point three. You need one point number dollar. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this one is not looking at ringgit one. Uh. I actually it's all looking at the entire package one uh, right? Like let's what? say let's say you ask me to work in Malaysia, but you give me like hundred thousand ringgit per month, also I will go one uh, right? <laughs> you need to look at the entire package. Everything is equal uh. It's only the the thing to Malaysian ringgit different uh. Yeah, I think I answered you uh. <laughs> Of course, the 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 strong currency is definitely helpful. You know, it's like, for example, like, let's say you just earn average salary in Singapore, right? But you don't feel like you are very special because you are just average. But let's say you are from Malaysia, you're thinking that, wow, if I just earn average salary in Singapore, that's a lot there compared to what I can earn in, in Malaysia, right? So that one will, will actually encourage you to, to move over, oh, right? But that's provided that the ringgit like the uh, sing dollar is very strong let's say if you come to singapore already suddenly sing dollar depreciate by 90 percent then first thing you are thinking about is like wow after convert back i earn so little why not i just go back to malaysia right so so it will, it will play it, it will influence the decisions it's just that you have to look at the entire package uh. okay actually like for thinking do you think like malaysia can ever catch up to singapore actually you you know like countries that are rich with oil right they are actually very rich like okay for example like saudi like brunei yeah if malaysia can actually use this money properly uh, i think there's a very high chance of malaysia, malaysia oil taking palm oil right there, there's not just not just palm oil like there's there's real oil off the coast of malaysia especially east malaysia yeah but you know the money doesn't reach the correct people sometimes actually having natural reserve in terms of like natural resources right might not be necessarily good thing in all cases though because i think the incentive is different to in a way create a well a good system and because you are desperate right like singapore they need to create a system so sometimes you might be the, the people driving the wheel might be a bit complacent i'm not saying i mean of course there are there are successful cases and there are edge cases that are not successful lah. But in general, I think even like, let's say you take the Saudi countries, having natural resources just means that external powers like to play with your area. La. Then they keep going in, interfere, do this and that, and, to, and then to create chaos. So, 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 so back to your question, right, on whether I think they can, they can, they can be better. I mean, in theory, if you have that X amount of people, even like, India have lost their way. I wouldn't say lost their way, but they haven't been performing over the last 20 years, right? But the potential is always there because the the the, the ability and the vast amount of people, skill sets, capabilities are there. And then they're experiencing some sort of a drain in terms of people going outside to seek opportunities like what Bunti said, right? Even in Malaysia, there are a lot of skills that are being exported out because people can see other opportunities. So in a way, I think if you really compare it from a very crude angle, Singapore is just this small piece of land with 5 million, 6 million people max. They let it let you push until 7, 8 million. But Malaysia's population is like, I don't know, five times bigger than us. And, and in theory, just mathematically speaking, they should have five times the talent that, that they have here. Of course, not discounting the fact that we can import talent as well because we are, we are positioned in a way to attract foreign talent. Lah. But what's stopping Malaysia from doing it? Then you can say about the legacy systems, um, a few of their biases and whatnot. But I do think that if we come from a, if, if we are able to start afresh and to think of how they can govern the system, there, there, there would be change. Lah. So I'm not, not going to say that, never say never. Um, I think there were many times in the last 
four decades that people say some countries cannot make it, but some countries did. And some countries that did very well also started falling down into the, the rankings. So in a way, if, if, if you want to stay bullish, like meaning you say that you see the long-term trajectory of Malaysia to be bullish or not. For now, I'm still very bullish of Singapore because it's my home country anyway. But but I, I would say don't write them off. Lah. Don't say that they, 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 they're, not, they're not worthy of your attention or, or whatnot. So yeah, that's my very long answer to your short question. Okay. The topic of what's my exchange rate that I'll go there. I would say that I would say that it's similarly to Bunti that you need to see the whole like like what 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 are the push and pull factors lah. Cannot be just because exchange rate is good, that's why you go. Even today, Singapore and US dollar or British pound is better, right? Like doesn't mean that you will go to US or UK purely because of the exchange rate. I think you also need to take into consideration like what career you are in. Is it better to the, the, is the infrastructure there better about your friends, your families, and 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 all those stuff lah. So that's that's that. Yeah. Also the tax. Mm, yes, the tax as well. Yeah. Okay. So if not, any other final questions from Kevin or Eric? Yep. Okay. So hope you guys enjoyed the discussion. Feel free to leave in the comments below on whether you're bullish on Malaysia or not. And we'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.